Thank you, everybody, and welcome to today's meeting of the Housing Committee. Members of the public may like to follow at London Assembly on Twitter and use the hashtag, hashtag London Housing for this meeting. And please, can I remind participants to silence your devices? <laughs> the main item on the agenda today is an investigation into women and housing in London. However, we do have some short items of business first. So can I please ask our committee clerk, Diane Richards, to confirm today's apologies? Thank you, Chair. No apologies for absence have been received today, but in accordance with Standing Order 2.4, Assembly Member Devonish will participate in the meeting remotely. Thank you. And uh, can we note the list of, of offices held by Assembly Members? And can I also ask members if they have any disclosable pecuniary interests in any specific items listed on today's agenda? Great. And anybody that wants to, there's a full list on the website. Okay. Um, and so that moves us on to item three, the minutes. Can we confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of May 2022? Great. Um, and item number four, summary list of actions. Can we note the completed, closed and outstanding actions arising from the previous meetings of the committee? And can we note the recent responses to the committee's outputs? Namely, the response from the Mayor to, of London to the Pandemic Financial Health and Housing Security Report and the responses from the Mayor of London and the Ministry of Justice to the committee's letters regarding alternative methods of increasing social housing in London. Great. And that brings us nicely on to our main item of business, which is a discussion on women and housing in London, which is a really, really important topic. And in particular, the challenges that women face when seeking safe, secure and affordable housing. So I'd like to welcome our guests to the chamber today. Thank you so much for coming to our new City Hall. Um, we will have me joining us, Zaiba Qureshi, Chief Executive from Housing for Women. We also have um, Sarah Rees, the Deputy Director and Head of Research and Policy at the UK Women's Budget Group. We have Kossa Butt, Head of Accommodation Services at Solace Women's Aid. Hannah Nursadiki, Head of Policy, Research and Fundraising at South All Black Sisters. And Natalie Daniels, who's the Assistant Director for Housing at, Greater, at the GLA. Thank you very much. Um, great. So, um, I would probably kick off with the first um, round of questions, if that's okay. And um, as you do come in, um, we obviously have a biog short biography of each of your organisations, but it would be really helpful to just give us a flavour of what you what you do, um, also for the benefit of those watching. So, I will start with um, Sarah and. Um, and Zyber arrives will also ask her the same, um, and that is about how you feel the gender pay gap um, influences housing affordability in London, and how does it differ from the rest of the UK? Uh, hello, so my name is Sara Reis. Uh, I'm Deputy Director of the Women's Budget Group. Uh, so we are a research and policy organisation, a non-profit, and we do analysis uh, of policy, uh, particularly economic policy, on women, the impact of that policy on women and men. And so we've done uh, some work on uh, housing, particularly housing affordability uh, in England. So we've done some work back in 2018, 2019, and more recently we've updated some of our figures uh, on housing affordability to uh, the latest data, so 2021. Uh, so I'll be able to, to provide some more updated figures. So when it comes to the gender pay gap, um, that is one of the main reasons uh, for the gap in housing affordability for women and men, uh, between women and men. Uh, so because of the gender pay gap, uh, women earn less per hour, uh, which means that um, they have a bigger difficulty in uh, affording uh, both uh, buying a house and also renting privately um, but I would I would like to say that the gender pay gap uh, when when measured by our is only uh, one of the measures of um, kind of women's economic circumstances when we look at gender uh, the the gap in um, earnings between women and men that is even um, bigger 
than the gender pay gap, and that is because women are more likely to work part-time, which means that um, on top of earning less per hour, women also earn less overall because they work fewer hours and because part-time work tends to be lower paid um, than uh, full-time work. So when it comes to London in 2021, the um, gender earnings gap, so when we look at the annual um, earnings, the average uh, annual earnings, the gap between women and men for um, London in 2021 was 24%. Um, that compares, that is slightly lower than uh, England on average. So for England, the um, earnings gap is 32%, uh, but is still a considerable um, gap, which will then translate into um, a, a bigger challenge when it comes to affording a home of uh, one's own when it comes to women. Thank you, that's really interesting. And um, whilst it's good that we're ahead of England, 24% is still quite substantial, especially with the cost of living crisis and other issues at the moment. Um, I wanted to also ask you about the differences in the gender pay gap, I guess within the total grouping of women, it's slightly more intersectionally. Um, the gender pay gap differs between, for example, um, white women and others, but and the black and global majority women as black and global majority women as well. Um, it would be really interesting to know what you think are the experiences of um, those women, but also other groups of women. I also think about um, LGBT women as well. Um, just yeah, to get your thoughts on that. Sure. So uh, that is absolutely right. Uh, the um, housing affordability will be a greater challenge for particular groups of women. And um, so ethnicity is a big sort of structural inequality uh, in the labor market, and that translates into uh, a bigger gap when it comes to earnings for women from particular um, ethnic backgrounds. Uh, and I'm thinking in particular um, women from black uh, backgrounds, uh, women from uh, Bangladeshi, Pakistani uh, backgrounds as well, Black and Caribbean uh, backgrounds. So those are some of the groups um, wh where women are um, facing um, ha bigger challenges when it comes to affordability because they earn even less than the kind of the average uh, woman. Um, so when it comes to disability, disability is also a, an important uh, structural inequality. Disabled women, um, the, the pay gap that disabled women uh, face is even larger than able-bodied uh, women. Um, and so again, they will face um, that uh, additional challenge when it comes to affording a home of their own and in particular, some disabled women, particularly with uh, women with um, uh, motor uh, disabilities, they will have particular needs when it comes to housing, uh, housing accessibility and um, some adaptations, mm -hmm. which means that the pool of housings available, pool of housing, sorry, available um, from which they can rent or, or buy is smaller um, and so that's an added challenge uh, for disabled women. Um, another group which also faces um, challenges or big challenges when it comes to housing affordability is single parents. Mm -hmm. So we know that you know the, the vast majority, um, I think it's eight, between 85 and 90% and of single parents are women uh, and uh, they are one of the most, one of the um, poorest uh, groups in, in society. And so single parents also have a, um, they also face a bigger, a bigger challenge when it comes to accessing affordable housing for them. Um, 
so those those are some of the main uh, groups um, that I, that I can think of in terms of LGBT um, people. We haven't um, we haven't got the data uh, at at WBG. Um, when it comes to uh, earnings to be able to to tell which groups or uh, if, if some of the groups have a, a particular challenge when it comes to um, housing affordability but we know that there are issues around uh, discrimination mm -hmm. uh, that these groups face which uh, is, is, is definitely also a barrier to okay. consider and so that data collection that you talked about is that a piece of work that your organization along with all of the data sets that you've already got you're looking to understand more about L the experiences of LGBT women? So we, we rely a lot on the available oh, okay. data. So, so this is, I think this is a uh, mostly an issue of the how the available data when it comes to earnings, when it comes to um, uh, wages, salaries, all, all of that, um, how that data is disaggregated right. by protected characteristics. And when it comes to uh, sexuality, gender identity, it's very difficult to find good quality data uh, on labor market experiences and on earnings for these groups. So one of the things that, that might change this is the uh, census data that is being released, uh, which hopefully will help us. Um, and when I say us, I mean you know civil society and also policymakers and others to understand a bit better the experience uh, of these uh, groups. Okay. And is there anything that the GLA has that you think there are gaps or are they reflected in what you've just described that the lack of public data um, that we could, or the GLA or others could provide more of? What would be more help, what would be helpful to you? When it comes to the, um, to, to, to understanding housing affordability yes, for different groups. to be able to compare across different cohorts of women. So I think, I think there are two things that are very helpful when it comes to uh, data and data collection and data analysis. One is making sure that, particularly when it comes to housing affordability, making sure that um, data on earnings is disaggregated by different protected characteristics. So at the moment, it's, it's fairly easy to find data disaggregated by sex, data disaggregated by age, um, ethnicity to some extent as well. But then uh, I think for most other category, for most other protected characteristics, the data isn't just systematically uh, broken down by, by those characteristics. So it's, it's difficult to um, produce research and produce analysis uh, for those other groups. Uh, and the other thing that is very helpful is to have cross-tabulation uh, between different protected characteristics. So what I mean is, for instance, while it's fairly easy to find data on uh, disaggregated by sex and data disaggregated by ethnicity, when you want to find out the experiences of or the circumstances of um, black women, for instance, there is just not the um, data uh, which combines the two uh, characteristics. Okay. So you can only find one thing or the other, but when you want to do a, a more kind of intersectional analysis, that becomes um, very hard with the available data. Okay. Thank you. Assembly member Berry. Thank you very much. <coughs> that was incredibly interesting um, and and useful. Um, I just I just wanted to ask: Did you, when you're looking at policy solutions to this, do you find that there's enough in the mayor's policies, Sa Sarah? Before I move on to ask the mayor's representative. S sorry, can you repeat? The do you find there's enough in the mayor's policies to deal to tackle the specific issues you're looking at there? I think w one of the main. Um, things that we've been calling for to tackle this issue is investment in social housing. I think that that for us at, at WBG and, and I know for, for, for others is crucial because um, it will ensure that there is generally affordable and um, tenancy secure homes. Uh, and I think for women that is particularly important because as we've seen if women 
on average earn less than men, then the um, their ability to find a home in the private market it is much greater. And so social housing is particularly important um, for women. So I think that that is the main um, the main thing that we'd like to see. Um, and also making sure that when s uh, local government and uh, in, in this case uh, uh, the mayor are investing or, or encouraging the building of affordable housing that is generally affordable for women as well so that it takes into consideration the fact that women uh, again on average earn less than men and so if you just take the average earnings in a, in a local area to establish your affordable uh, housing, that will mean that you will be out of reach still for, um, f for many women. So, so there you're talking about the London living rent, which is defined as affordable. Yes. But looks at median earnings in the area. Overall, yes. yes. Have, you asked, have you spoken with the mayor's team about changing that? I haven't, no. Okay, I have as an assembly member, and and it hasn't been changed yet. So I'll, if I if I can move on to asking that very specific question to Natalie, but also would you like to, after you've answered the question about London living rent, just outline mo some more of the things that the mayor is doing currently to address affordability in housing for women specifically? Yes, sure. um, thank you, thank you, Sarah, and and thanks to the assembly for looking at this topic. It's really important to me personally as well. Um, I think when it when it comes to London living rent, I think you probably have had this discussion with us before, so I, I, I'll let you go back to those prior discussions. I wasn't part of them. It's fair to say that when we initiated London living rent, it was with the intention of identifying other options for genuinely affordable housing. And we have... Uh, we have a limiting factor about the take up of that that's with regards to the fact that we do not determine the tenures that are taken up by delivery agents or by local authorities and necessarily how they relate to how women are prioritised in the social housing system. I think there's levers for that to happen and local authorities seek to do it, but they've obviously got their own jurisdiction in that regard and I'm sure they'd love to come and speak to you about it. With London Living Rent, we are we do we do review the setting of that on an annual basis Hi. <laughs> um, and it's it's fair to say that we need to do that in a robust and sensible way I think the other factor that's important to note about London living rent is that we are still working with the sector to move it to a place where it is a tried and tested product that is therefore taken by the delivery agents because what we all have to come back to here and I think what we're all valiantly working towards is about the impact. Yes, we can do these pilots and yes, we can get this data, but what we really want to find is scale and impact. And I think with that particular tenure option, it's absolutely fair to say that we should consider this in, in the evolution of it. And I take that point and we, we certainly will and thank you. Um, and we'd also be very open to having conversations with you about how we do that. But at the moment, the issue with that product is a more fundamental one where we are working really closely with providers who've had some significant take up of it in its nascent phase, but we need to work with them to ensure it's it's working for the people it's seeking to serve because we don't quite yet have that we're still working at that proof of concept stage, I think it's fair to say, and we need to look at that in our medium programs, but I think the medium term programs, but it's a fair challenge. Um, and then with regards to working towards affordable housing, I agree with you more than you do, like we absolutely need to work towards that. It is the intention of everything about our housing strategy to really put supply front and center and to look for genuine affordability in that. We're using the levers that we that we have within the program. We worked really hard in negotiations with central government to seek to move their parameters towards social housing as much as possible in the settlement that we will enact after in this current year, but for the next three years in the 21 to 26 AHP. And we absolutely have a clear intention 
to say we want to work on more social rent and more social housing in the medium term and that is absolutely part of all our negotiation strategy um, about how we secure the how we secure the funding for that and the other ways that we are working with the sector to try and secure that affordable secure that affordable housing is is fundamentally about delivery of scale diversity of agents that we're working with and making sure that they are starting and completing homes at an adequate rate that can serve London. And it's fair to say that we all know the numbers that are there in the, the London Housing Plan um, have not, we're not at that scale yet because the requirement is huge. I think we are making progress, but we, we need to keep working closely with the sector. Does that answer your question, Sean? I some some of it I've got further follow up questions <laughs> as well. Um, I mean I think I think you know we we all agree that the overwhelming need is for more social rented homes. But in that when we're talking about an earnings gap um, and we're talking about women who are working and earning less, that intermediate rent is a is a big gap. And I think for a lot of key workers, it really ought to be um, addressed. Um, now, can I ask, do you monitor and track which demographics of Londoners are benefiting from the different affordable housing products and programmes that you do because that would obviously help us to track where there were gaps. I might have to check myself properly on this question outside of that so I'll give my best answer by yeah, I mean, you said you said that you're not responsible for the allocations but do you track the allocations well, afterwards? So, yeah so this is the so I think the connection it comes back to the I think the phrase you use was cross tabulation um, which I've never used before, so if I use it incorrectly, please stop me. Um, but I think what we have as an output is is we we understand the tenure output at completion, and we understand w we can we can have proxy data that helps us understand the size of households that go in there. But to the best of my knowledge. And our team, I think, have worked on this to try and find that because it would absolutely inform our strategy, making the cross tabulation connection between the demographics of those who are housed and the housing output is something we can only do, I think, by proxy data rather than direct because we don't have, we do not know the individuals who are placed in the homes that we supply the funding for. That's, that's a chain beyond ours. Is that I, the I know it's not data you hold, but it is data that you've given grants to people. When, you, when you're giving a grant, you could make evaluation of the impact, the assessment of whether it's benefiting different groups equally, compare that with the demand for housing in those different groups. That would be a really useful thing to do. And you could make it so that anonymised data was shared back to you by the people who supply that housing eventually. Yeah, we can, and we're, we're actually in the process of an evaluation um, with the look because the scale of that endeavour is significant. Um, so we're working on a medium-term evaluation of this programme with the look to try and establish how we can do that and how we can do that in a sensible way, the outputs of which we'll be able to discuss in a future period, I think probably next year, because it's possible but the scale of resource required to do that tracking and evaluation is substantial so we need to target that in the sense in a sensible way mm -hmm. and consider how i'm a fan of data but i think in in the scale of programs that we're working on and the aggregate levels of information we're dealing with there can be an intention there to use that data appropriately to inform strategy and the evidence basis for our strategy are clear in there in the housing plan and we've dis I think we discuss in it where we would like more data and it's shared with a lot of the things that you're saying especially as we work towards a holistic sense of what diversity and inclusion means in housing outcomes but we do have to be targeted in how we would put resources in and who are the appropriate parties to be conducting that research and holding that data so one of the reasons why um, We've we are participating completely and fully in this monitoring and evaluation exercise with the look about the programme is exactly so that we can be better informed and have a clearer idea of how we will, how we could identify that data and then use it towards strategy. Because yeah, we recognise the same point you're making. Yeah, so then there's an obvious use for that in um, when we're negotiating and lobbying for the next yeah. round of affordable housing funding. 
if we can demonstrate that certain groups have not benefited enough from the current rounds of funding, leaving an unmet need, that's that's one thing you might use. Yeah, it for. And, and we've and I think we have we have so we've we've used the proxy data that we have for those negotiations previously. I think one of the things that. Um, is is fair to say and has been evaluated by others, but the central government process for negotiating the terms of an affordable housing programme, both in London and nationally, and you know it, it's really I think it's really useful to be able to look at this information um, comparatively across that. But in the engagement that both ourselves and Homes England have, I think it's fair to say that it's recognised in central government and in the look that improvements could be made in how affordable housing programme settlements are made in the future, precisely so they can take greater account with more evidence and an appropriate lead-in for this kind of evidence. And I think it's a really positive place that by us as an institution bringing in more, uh, I don't want to use the word tangential because that makes it sound secondary, but additional outputs as well as just the number of homes on the ground into our programme, some of which have been mimicked by Homes England, we've got DLOOK into a place where they recognise that requirement as part of a future settlement negotiation. That's so put these things com coming together is timely. Um, and we need to harness that moment when it comes forward after what is clearly going to be a minor government hiatus. Yeah, no, that's, that's really good news in terms of potentially evaluating the costs and benefits of different investments as well. Um, so my final question um, is a big one though. <laughs> um, given all, the, all the, the, the new awareness there is of things like structural inequalities for women, for people of colour, for LGBT people, disabled people, the fact that there are structural inequalities within systems, yep. that's better known now than when the housing strategy was put together. We've also got, had changes in uh, the economy, changes in the cost of living since that document was written. Do you think that, particularly now we've also got new census data, the actual housing strategy document might do with a rewrite and a refresh at, at this point? Um, end with a small one. Uh, so I think it's fair to say we recognise all of that and m I think it, it is the case that the housing strategy is published in accordance with, it sits with the London plan and it sits, it, they sit as a complementary set that's, that's, that's about the legislative approach to the powers that we have under the GLA Act to have a London plan and what that means. So we will revisit that at the appropriate cycle. And I think building up all of this evidence in the interim is appropriate for that. And I think I, I certainly see it as more than an addendum, but the policy and programmatic in interventions that we make as a result of being informed by that evidence can be live and can be responsive. So things like the work that we've done to bring in the domestic abuse duty, things like the work we've done to make adjustments in our rough sleeping programs in accordance with this evidence so we can work with more intersectional communities and can highlight the needs of women in that space which have previously had less amplification than I would think they should have done. So, so it's a fair challenge to say we need to have a, a strategy that's responsive, but the power of that is based in its accompaniment of a key power that the mayor has and that is vital but what's also vital is m us as a team making a link between the environment for those for the people who for the londoners who are having these experiences the evidence that we have for that how that informs live and active policy and strategy and how that comes into programs because speaking speaking probably as the daughter of two social workers and the sister of another rather than in my current role if i'm that survivor i'm not going to read that policy what i'm going to be what i'm going to be impacted by is that program and what it does for me and how it keeps me and my family if i have one safe and so that's that's the link that we want to make sure can be as responsive and speedy as funding will allow great thank you
Um, thank you very much for that, Natalie. Um, Assembly Member Baker will have further questions at a later point about domestic abuse and survivors. And I wanted to welcome you, Zyber. Thank you for joining us. And um, hopefully you've got settled. Um, there were some questions at the top which I'd like to put to you, which we put to Sarah, if that's OK. And um, before I start those, to Kossa and Hanana, obviously we're trying to keep to the structure of the meeting as we have it, but if there's anything that's said that you'd like to respond on behalf of, well, from the perspective of your organisations, it's really, really welcome to just enrich the evidence that we gather today. So if I can, yes, welcome, and um, thank you for joining us. Um, we, I did ask when we started um, to Sarah, um, how does the gender pay gap influence housing affordability and um, how does it differ from the rest of the UK, so from your pers organisation's perspective? So it'd be really great to have your view. Um, hi, and firstly, just to apologise for, for, for turning up late. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, I mean, obviously, the gender pay gap is a, is a real uh, issue that we're, we're all tackling, essentially. Um, uh, I think it's, it's very clear that the majority of women, women face disproportionate challenges. Um, Sorry, could you just could you, could you just repeat the question again? Yeah, I'm sorry. of course. Um, how does the gender pay gap influence housing affordability in London, and how does that differ from the rest of the UK? So I think the the key the key um, point here is really about the sort of uh, the cost of of um, housing in London uh, compared with. Um, the rest of the UK, although some other cities may have um, uh, premium sort of rates for housing, essentially. Um, but I would say in London, we have a particular issue. For example, we, we provide social, social housing. Uh, we don't do any sort of intermediate rent uh, uh, or any of the products. Um, and our, our rent levels are something in the region of £521 a month compared to market rent of 16, you know, on average. 16, pounds so 32 percent of the market rent really so the gender pay gap um in terms of the impact that um uh that's further exacerbated really th from covid and the cost of living uh crisis that we've got means that sort of wages and benefits are being eroded in real terms for women um again specifically that i would say that that gap between um, what women are earning in London and the cost of accommodation, particularly market rented accommodation or private rented and even affordable rented accommodation, I would say, is becoming less affordable. Um, I don't have any direct experience of that because it's not a product we, we supply, really. Um, but even, in, even with our very, very low rents, women are finding it increasingly difficult to sustain their tenancies. Okay, and then my other question was that um, between, um, so that gender pay gap between different groups of women, um, how that differs, um, and my question to Sarah was around black and global majority Londoners, women Londoners, and other groups such as LGBT Londoners, um, disabled Londoners, which you mentioned, I forgot to mention, but just if you have any perspectives on that as well. I think I think it's really the the erosion of um, benefits as well. Really, so benefits haven't risen in in line with um, inflation. Um, I know there's lots of calls on on uh, central government for that to to increase. Um, but I would say um, it, that intersectionality of need really for for um, black and minority I think women and those who are disabled or those who are single mothers as well really that impact of benefit. Um, benefits not rising in line with inflation is having a massive impact. Thank you. Assembly member, I've got his surname now. Yes, that one. Cooper, yes. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to come back to Natalie and then I'm going to come out to um, everybody if I may. Um, in 2021, the Merrill Manifesto stated that he would launch a cross-sector policy forum to coordinate efforts to advance gender equality after COVID-19. And I wondered if you could give an update on um, how that work is progressing and whether that work is definitely going to be considering um, issues that relate to advancing gender equality in housing. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I just realised I called the other Assembly member, Sean, and you're addressing each other by Assembly member in your surname, so thank you, Paul. Honestly, uh, it's, re it's really it's fine. fine. <laughs> it's, it's, it's mainly for the cameras, really. It's, um, it's, it's absolutely fine. You can call me Leonie if you want to. <laughs> it's OK. Um, so I, I think we're, we've been in a stage where we still consider ourselves to be in COVID, so we're, we're definitely looking at that. A useful forum in the interim has been the London Housing Board, where we've got various representatives on there that have given us a sounding board. And as you'll be aware, we've refreshed that to make sure we can, we've, can, we've extended the, fun the funding of that, and we've refreshed it to try and make sure we can have that variety of experience and lived experience informing our policy position. Yeah, I was just going to say, can I clarify, is that the London Housing Board panel. or the London Housing Panel? panel. Panel. Okay. Thank yep. you. I beg your pardon. Yeah, because some of us were quite involved in uh, some discussions about the refresh of the funding. Yes, indeed. Um, and I, I think we need we, we will be looking at that commitment again shortly. And in the process of looking at it, absolutely, we'll be looking at how it can address minority Londoners and, of course, women and girls are part of that. And I think what's what's a really important moment for all of us here, and I really respect the panel you've put together because I think it recognises that, is that intersectionality is is so key when when we talk about these things because beyond the kind of statistical word of cross-tabulation, there's just Londoners who are finding it harder. And I think we've got a genuine, there's a, there's a genuine intent, not just in, in housing, um, but in all of the mayor's programmes to really consider holistically what it means to support what it means to support vulnerable Londoners and I think some of the seeds of what we're thinking about and how we're thinking of um, going forward with that policy and that and that forum in our team do come back to the the sub work that's happening within programs so even when we have a rough sleeping program and we're looking at assisting women we're also looking at assisting migrant women because they've got a particularly difficult journey in that um, and when we're looking and thinking about how we're going to enact our domestic abuse duty we're thinking about how we can support organizations that work with black and global minority londoners we're thinking about that with the move on program um, so yes, absolutely, and we'll, we will be we will be continuing to think about that. I'm very happy to keep talking to but you and the sector about but it. But right now, the launch of the cross sector policy forum hasn't happened because we're it's not, not deeming yet. ourselves to be post COVID. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to open this one up to everybody. I mean, obviously, there are an awful lot of need, um, and we're sort of probably scratching the surface really in terms of looking at specific. Um, needs of um, women who fall into lots of different groups and also have additional areas, you know, talking about uh, pe being homeless, being a woman who's homeless and then being a migrant woman who's homeless and you can layer that up in, you know, being a lesbian and then being an older lesbian and, and you know, and we've just talked about the, the issue around wages. Do you think, and I'll start with Natalie and then go along the road and see if anyone else wants to add anything to that, that personalised rents tailored to individual incomes could be an option. And I'll start with Natalie. Yeah, um, if I can just go back to, if you just give me a second, I, uh, I made some notes on personalised rents because I think it's a more complicated issue. It is quite a complicated issue. Um, so if you can... Yeah, I think that was our feeling when we were looking at some of the, the data, certainly um, it is quite hard to see how it, uh, you know, tracking it backwards and forwards, but, yeah. you know, it is being implemented elsewhere. Yeah, so so, so do you, can you see any benefits from it? I think there's, there's the obvious potential benefit of, it addresses some of Zara's points about the connection between, the, the connection between, between people's available income and the proportion of that that's expended on rent um, and that's that's an inherent and obvious an obvious benefit I think it is being it, it has been trialed in some places I think the reason why the, uh, there's there's many reasons why although it has it has clear logical benefits it's it's challenging 
to enact relates to the incentives that are there for people to in t the, the incentives that are, are there for people in terms of how they access the welfare and the benefit system. So I think it can distort some of that and it can take away the responsibilities from where they should be. I think it can distort some of the incentives that are about giving people the freedom of choice in terms of how they re-enter into the workforce at the appropriate time um, because of how, how those might be tracked, the personalised rents might be tracked or monitored. Um, so, it, so I think the benefit to me is clear, but again, when we go back to impact and scale, I think the scalability of that as a solution appears quite challenging. Um, but I, I'd, I'd welcome I'd welcome views from the panel because I think as a team we've we've not looked at it as recently as we as we would have liked. I might pick on um, Zyber actually because obviously ha you can look at it from the organisational perspective of someone who's charging rents as, as well as looking at it from the you know the person who might be yeah. in the offered the personalised <coughs> rent. Thanks, Leonie. Um, uh, I think um, yeah, I think I think from our perspective, I don't know a huge amount about this scheme. I had to do a bit of research myself, really, because it's not it's not something that we operate really. Um, but I think. On one on one level, it's good to have a scheme that offers choice, really. So, um, and and it will work for some women in some circumstances, really. But I think what we know of uh, about um, a, a number of women, particularly those on sort of, um, uh, you know, they're in the lower lower income grades, they're in work that's sort of zero hour contracts, um, to work working hours fluctuate. Um, the caring responsibilities have have have, ish, have uh, impact in terms of their income. Um, they're on no paid jobs. Um, I think keeping track of all of those changes against um, a rental income, uh, a rental uh, charge, should I say, I think is well, it's really it's incredibly difficult. I don't I don't even know how that is actually going to be done. If I'm completely honest. Yeah, it's difficult enough with people in those sort of more just, precarious work arrive. situations to make sure they don't end up with recoverable overpayments of housing benefit yeah, when I their mean, salaries go up and down. Exactly. So. In the current circumstances, it's it's difficult enough for people yeah. who are in social rented accommodation. As yes. I say, I'll give the example of our organisation to keep track of their universal credit. You know, when it's coming when it's coming in, when it's not coming yeah. in. And when there's any changes, really, so I'd, I, I'd be interested to hear more from from Dolphin and, and other organisations who mm. are piloting this um, as to sort of the practicalities of how that's going to work in real in real life, really. Thank you. I don't know whether anyone do you want to come in and and talk about um, it from the solace point of view. No, I'm very happy to just leave it there. It's I think it's perhaps uh, we're I think we're all agreeing it's incredibly complicated. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I think uh, the only other point that I'd make, just going back to my notes, um, is because of the... Pra I'm aware that when we talk about practicalities, that feels like quite a heartless reason <laughs> to not do something. Um, but but I think the other thing that we're all, work we're all trying to foster here is we're trying to foster a sector that can support these individuals. And if we're trying to foster a sector that can support these individuals that sector is not going to start as being necessarily a huge organisation with huge administrative capacity. Mm. And so I, I wouldn't want the intention of helping the client to incur an administrative burden that breaks the organisation as a going concern, because actually what a really important part of what needs to be stable here is about the organisation itself. And so I, I just wanted to come back to that because I feel like I, I, I recognise that it sounds heartless to say admin, but, but the scale of complexity of lives that we're talking about dealing with is, is, is really quite something. No, it? I think that's completely justified and, and certainly the recoverable overpayment issue. Mm -hmm. I'm dealing with someone who actually wants to leave the country very shortly 
and has just been finished paying off a very large recoverable overpayment and has now just been told that there's another £6,000 that they need to, to pay. And, you know, I can't be the only person, uh, several of us have been councillors or are councillors, and it comes up repeatedly that where people's, you know, situation changes, they end up with recoverable overpayments to say nothing of the reverse impacts on, on organisations. But I'll leave it there, Chair. I'll come back with something else later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Assemblymember Cooper. Assemblymember Bailey. Uh, Bailey? Oh, my goodness. Boss. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it was an accident. <laughs> it's, it's a very hot day. I'm very confused about everything. Um, Assemblymember Boff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <What's that Jenny? laughs> I'll write people's names out in full from now on. <laughs> of responses to our calls for evidence uh, to Mr Rice if possible uh, noted that women often need larger homes uh, do you think that the size mix of new and existing homes uh, in London meets the specific needs of women uh, especially those with families I think certainly that was one thing that came out when we were doing our research uh, in 2018, 2019, <coughs> pardon, on um, women's needs when it came to, to housing and um, the mismatch of that with uh, what is available. So housing supply. So just, just to put this in context, the uh, research that we did was... Um, painted kind of a national picture but then we sort of zoomed in on Coventry so it's a very specific city obviously it's not it's not London but I think some of the issues that we found there would be um, similar to what uh, is is happening uh, here in London and one of the things that we found out when we spoke to frontline organizations in Coventry who were supporting women um, who had been victims of violence and um, they were trying to be rehoused was that accessing social housing in particular, units that were um, appropriate for larger families was an impossible uh, task, uh, nearly so. It was easier to find one bedroom flats or studios um, for like single single women or uh, women with just uh, one child for instance but when it came to larger families it was almost impossible to uh, house uh, them on the um, uh, available social housing um, so I would suspect that that's something that would be similar uh, in the capital in London um, and obviously that means that uh, larger families are disproportionately affected as well um, with with housing crisis. I think some of the evidence we've been given is that um, th those those factors work even more in London. Uh, mm. uh, 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 you know, the shortage of family-sized housing is even more uh, homes in London is even more uh, than the rest of the country. Um, they, I mean, w we went and visited the um, Akaya Housing Association and had a really uh, a great time, a great visit there indeed, um, to see a, a, an excellent scheme for uh, housing uh, predominantly young women. Um, they uh, were building more family, I mean, they, and that's where our information came from, to be honest, that, that family-sized homes would be something that they would favour. Would building more family-sized homes help meet the needs and challenges of women? And if so, in what way? Ha if we were to embark upon a programme of, of increasing the number of family-sized homes that we were uh, building? So I think that would be, um, that would benefit women uh, obviously, particularly the uh, the ones with with larger families, and I think it, it's worth um, noting that women are disproportionately responsible for dependence. So, um, 
for children and and for um, and for others who who may be uh, older or um, who may have a, a disability. Um, so this means that um, particularly when it comes to single parents, um, th there is a, a, a higher proportion of uh, single women with large families uh, than is the case with um, single men. So I think uh, investing in um, family-sized homes and the supply of family-sized homes would be of particular importance for single parents or single mothers in particular uh, who may have um, uh, several children. I think that would be one group that would uh, benefit uh, largely. Thank you very much. That's very, very explicit and to the point. Thank you. Um, perhaps open to the, the rest of the panel today, women are, are more likely uh, to live in social housing and uh, single parents are more likely to live both in social housing and uh, private rentals. Uh, does our panel here think that women are more likely to live in poorer quality housing and does this impact what impact does this have on women and their families? First of all, the question is, are women more likely to live in poorer quality housing? And then perhaps then anybody can, then you've got the evidence to support that. I would just like to say that women leaving refuge are forced to go into poorer housing because there isn't enough social housing and they have to go into private rental accommodation, which is unaffordable for them. Because of the under 35 women who don't have children, single women, are forced to go into those shared accommodation, like hostels, which are mixed. There aren't many single-sexed hostels for women, and they're forced into going to these conditions where they're, they're going to more dangerous areas and unsafe areas to live in because the affordability, the shared rate for under 35s, we know, does not accommodate them to go into their own properties. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Yeah, Speak. just... Um, well, South of Black Sisters, about 60% of the women we assist are migrant women who have gone through domestic abuse. And, um, I mean, they don't have right to benefits um, because they have no recourse to public funds. So usually they will have, you know, they'll rely on strangers, on charity, um, on friends and relatives who may take them in. And, and also, you know, they might be on the street, but also they are more likely to end up in hotels or bed and breakfasts and temporary accommodation, insecure accommodation, and have much poorer quality of housing generally um, um, because they don't have access to benefits, they can't pay their rent. And so, um, and usually if they're, if they're in a, an abusive relationship, um, they don't usually have the economic control because if you come in on a spousal visa, for example, and you're dependent, economically dependent on your spouse um, to stay here and to have, and you don't have access to benefits. So you don't even have control over your own housing that you may have been living in um, before you separated. Um, so if you, once you've separated, um, you know, you're, gen you're generally facing, you're destitute and you're facing homelessness. And it's extremely difficult to get good quality housing for them. We run, a, we had to run a no recourse fund, which is also partly funded by MOPAC, um, where we pay towards women's rent and subsistence so they can get into some kind of accommodation. It's quite hard to get them into a refuge accommodation, even though that's the safest you can find them, mainly because refugees, either full up or they um, do not take in women with no recourse to public funds because they're frightened that they won't be able to keep them long term because they can't pay their, pay their rent. Um, and usually we have to put them into bed and breakfast hotels and the quality of accommodation is much, much poorer for them. And there's no, even if they enter a refuge or, or anywhere temporary, there's no move on accommodation until their immigration status is resolved and they can claim benefits or, or they manage to find work. But usually that's very you know, low income when they do find work. Um, and that's if they have the right to work. 
So I think that they are, most, they are the most vulnerable group, the, the migrant women, in terms of housing. Thank you. Anybody else want to go? Um, just, just to add to the, the, what the other panel members have said already, and just to echo that, I, I guess really what I would say is that um, I think it's a, I don't want to make a fleeting generalisation that temp all temporary housing is poor housing because it's, it's not necessarily the case. And obviously there are, there are local authority licensing schemes that help to drive up the, the, the quality of, of housing. Um, but it is an unregulated um, sector ultimately. So there is a limit to sort of the, the quality assurance, I think, of, of, of um, private temporary accommodation. I think the other thing just to add to what, what my, my colleagues on the panel have said really is that high numbers of, um, there's a high number of single single mothers in temporary accommodation, as you'll know, um, and that can just be a sort of prolonged cycle, moving from one temporary accommodation to the next, um, either every six months, every year, however ho however long, really. So there's a lack of stability, as well as sort of quality of accommodation, there's a lack of stability for women, even even once they've moved into sort of temporary accommodation. It's not just a, na a natural move from temporary to, to permanent accommodation, really. So that cycle has a massive impact in terms of their recovery if, if, they've, if they've gone through abuse, uh, the impact on their children, um, and um, you know, maybe, maybe um, traveling for work and uh, caring responsibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Natalie, but can I ask the other panelists a bit of a dumb question, which is outside of the scope of this, but I your specialist in your field. Um, in the case of women who um, don't have permanent housing but might move into, I think, exempt accommodation, where does that all sit here in this conversation about women's housing? I was just interested in your point about um, refugees and women with no recourse to public funds. Um, where in the scheme of things is, is that as an option and what, what are your views about how it's used um, and how it could be fixed or whether it's just a diversion and the focus should entirely be on permanent social rented homes? Yeah, my question was about, um, it's just for, for my interest, but I think for others as well, where, where exempt accommodation fits in this wider conversation um, about where women are housed. I'm, I'm thinking about, um, first of all, a visit that I did in my constituency to um, the YMCA in Walthamstow, but also um, we've had, with, as part of this investigation, some evidence from the London Prisons Mission. And it's sort of, so the dumb question is, where do the women go who don't have anywhere? <laughs> And where does exempt accommodation fit in in the discussion about housing for women? Um, I'm sorry, I don't fully understand about what is exempt accommodation, but the um, thing is, women can go into refugees, they're migrant women, if they have no recourse to public funds. Problem is, they can't pay their rent because they don't have access to benefits or any kind of income. You know, they mean, it's most likely they're not working, and if they are working, it'll probably be very low income. And so technically, they can go into a refuge, but they just practically can't because they can't pay their rent. So they don't go anywhere. They're on the streets. They're homeless, unless groups like ourselves and charities pick them up and find ways of paying for their accommodation. There are some women who can get exempt if they can regularize their status. So those on spousal visas can claim the destitution and domestic violence concession and apply to stay in the country for a period of three months. And then they can get benefits and access to ho homelessness um, accommodation. But that's only for three months and they have to regularize their status. But those who have on non-spousal visas or, undoc or undocumented women don't have any those kind of rights, generally speaking. Some, some um, EU nationals and um, uh, pre-settlement status may do, but in most cases, they don't. Um, and usually, th they are driven back to abusive relationships because they've got nowhere to go. They're home on the streets. They're dependent on charity, and they're dependent 
aren't strangers and friends or relatives who might also force them to go back. Because a lot of these women that we deal with are from minority cultures. It's where it's very shameful for women to leave home and it's dishonorable and they come under a lot of family pressure and community pressure to go back, back home. And that pressure is intensified, of course, if they and their children are homeless. Now, they can go to social services as well, to go Section 17 funding or as a vulnerable adult, but social services responses tend to be very inconsistent. They often turn women away. They say they offer to take the children into care, but not the mother, so they don't keep the children and the mother together. Even though she's not abusive, she's just homeless. Um, that deters women from seeking help. Uh, sometimes they say they will put the children with the abusive father or a relative and not support the mother and the child together. Sometimes they won't do an assessment or they will take a long time to do an assessment, in which case she's got nowhere to go. Sometimes when they do help them, they're put into kind of low quality mixed accommodation and they can't get into a refuge accommodation. Uh, the, or they may not give them enough money for subsistence and so forth. Um, and sometimes we've had to go to court because of those, because they, they do have entitlements under Section 17, uh, but it's a battle. So, so we do have, we, under our No Recourse Fund, we do give women as a, bridge, a bridging um, money whilst they try to resolve problems with social services or apply under the Destitution and Domestic Violence Concession. But where women don't have those options, they are literally homeless. And that's one of the campaigns we're doing at the moment to change the law on that. But in the meantime, we, we think what needs to be done is actually more accommodation funded uh, by MOPAC and, um, and other authorities. And I know London Council does give some money, but it to to provide refuge accommodation for women with no recourse to public funds. So you need bed spaces, or you need dedicated refuges, or you need more money in our no recourse fund, because it's a London-wide fund, uh, where we can then also fund better quality housing or longer-term funding to refugees. At the moment, the most we can do is about 12 weeks, but if we had more money, we could put them in refuges for much longer. And because women, may not have an automatic right to stay. They stay there for much longer whilst to try to resolve their immigration status. And therefore, refugees are reluctant to take them in. So if we can fund it for longer at the level that's required for refuge-supported accommodation, that's the best option. And I think that's where the GLA and MOPAC um, can improve the situation. Can I just add, in May 2020, we funded with South Pole Black Sisters Solace Women's Aid a Crisis 19 COVID project, which was for women regardless of their immigration status. Half of those women had no immigration status. That was interim support provided to them to get them off the streets, to enable them to have stability, to get support and to move on to accommodation. What we need is similar projects. We need funding for similar projects. And ones for women with multiple disadvantage who are excluded from refugees because of their high support needs. And also with rough sleepers, as there are not recognised female rough sleepers, because it's mainly dominated by males, we need services for our women who are rough sleeping, who also can go into hostels, single sex hostels, um, because there are restrictions in borough. If somebody's out to borough, they can't access a particular borough's hostel. We need more provision for femless, female homeless sleepers. Thank you. Did you want to come back, Hanala? No, I think that, that um, the project that we did with Solis that was funded by MOPAC was only a crisis one during COVID because we saw a huge increase, uh, if, certainly from our perspective around migrant women needing accommodation. And we had to sort of, they were literally destitute. And even those women on spousal visas who do have some rights um, to, to get benefits if they apply under the destitution domestic violence concession, couldn't get them quick enough. There was a long gap. Uh, because of the lockdown, and so we had, and, and refugees were totally kind of full up. We, they, we couldn't get their, get them into refugees either. So yeah, I mean, I think those kind of projects, that's no longer funded. So those kind of projects are really useful. That temporary accommodation, but safe accommodation. I, I think, obviously, we want supported refuge, safe type of accommodation for all women. 
uh, including migrant women, which at the moment they are denied, and also where there's intersections with other vulnerabilities that they're often denied as well, such as disability, such as mental health problems. So these are also quite, rate, uh, quite high amongst the women that we assist. So that specialist need is, needs to be improved. Um, I also would say that you need other type of um, specialist accommodation for women for, or younger women, for example, who are facing things like forced marriage and honour-based abuse because there's only one refuge in the whole of London that's sort of dedicated to forced marriage. Although you may be able to get them into another refuge, there's very little provision. And one of the things that we find that if they go to the homeless, homelessness uh, department in the council, um, they're not always, you know, they're not always treated as in priority need. Um, and they may be, you know, under pressure to provide evidence. And this also happens with victims of domestic abuse. But you often find single women find it much more difficult to get help from, or, or couples who are trying to run away from honor-based violence and, and a forced marriage. And just getting that to be regarded as domestic abuse, even though that's within the legal definition, um, and, and for the local authority to take responsibility for assisting them uh, is also quite difficult. Okay. Thank you. My colleague, Assemblymember Baker, has got some questions later All about... Right. Um, no, no, it's really helpful about Thank domestic you. abuse and domestic violence. If I could bring in Assemblymember Devonish, who's joining us remotely. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon. Very interesting discussion. Would the panel agree this is probably one of the most complex areas of public policy? And would you think it would be uh, helpful, or maybe there already is, Natalie will tell me I'm already, uh, you've already invented the wheel. Is there a document, a nice simple process chart that's not page after page of public sector speak that says how and who you can go to for funding? Because there are a lot of GLA budgets People have mentioned the GLA directly. They've mentioned MOPAC in the discussions. We all know there's lots of bits of the GLA. And many of us over the years have been pressing the fact that much of the budgets within housing have been famously underspent by various teams at the GLA. So my question really to the panel is, are you aware, uh, and do you think you're fully aware of the complexity of how you get money out of the various bits of the GLA and whether, whether Natalie can then comment after hearing from the panel in terms of how she can make it easier to signpost those pots of money, which I certainly believe are often underspent within the GLA. Um, just to come back on that, it's a, I think it's a really interesting question. And when I sort of, um, when people ask me about how we, we provide a lot of specialist projects for women who have been trafficked or women coming out of prison, um, and I, I, I say to people, we, we're working on a patchwork of funding, basically. Um, we happen to have a housing association attached to us, but we are linked in with um, women's sector organisations who are literally sort of, um, you know, hand to mouth, essentially, in terms of funding. So I think, um, not specifically the GLA, but I think that there is definitely no one single um, repository of information that um, shares uh, funding uh, availability for uh, women's services. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure other panel members will, will um, hopefully agree with that. Um, I think one of the um, issues is that there's a combination of um, applying for funds in a, in a sort of linear way and there's the competitive um, contracting that happens on a local authority basis. So I'll use domestic violence as a as a as an example. So um, there's three there's three members of this panel who would be set against each other really in a competitive tendering process um, for uh, a bidding process for for contracts. Um, now there there are lots of sort of um, political with a small p um, sort of issues around that. Um, and I think what, what it does is it, it um, erodes the, the women's sector, essentially, and it erodes the um, <coughs> specialisms that each of us bring to the table. So I would really um, support sort of more collaborative um, commissioning, I, th I think, really, 
um, with the women's sector. There's a lot of expertise, um, not just within this room, but beyond this room uh, with other colleagues. Um, and um, there's a lot of expertise around getting other sorts of money into the pot as well. Um, so, for example, we, we make a lot of applications to trusts and foundations. We bring in uh, pro bono um, and corporate partners. And I'm sure, you know, again, there's probably a myriad of other uh, funding opportunities that other, other partners could bring to the table, really. So okay. I think it's really about the, the collective um, uh, scale of endeavour, really. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zyba. Um, Assembly Member Berry. Thank you very much. Um, shall, I, shall I answer that? I know Tony sort oh, of referred yeah. to me, but I was, I was waiting to see if anyone else on the panel wanted to say anything. Oh, before yes. I Sorry. Sorry. Just quickly, I think, um, one, no, we have no idea what funding there, there is in GLA, and it would be great to have a flow chart. Um, but, but also I think we need to remember that um, small organisations have a very low capacity, and they need to be supported. So obviously to access that funding, but also to stop the, the competitive bidding, because that also makes it, you cannot compete against a large organization if you're a small organization. Um, and I think you've got to remove commissioning processes and replace them with grant making processes that used to exist, that were much simpler and easier to, to navigate, and that's really useful for a small organization. Uh, uh, yeah, collaborative funding is important, it's important sh and partnership and consortiums, and we've gone, you know, we've used all those mechanisms, but you still don't get a lot of money from each of those contracts, even if you manage to win them as a collective. Um, because you're a small organization, you get a small money. You can hardly lead the, lead the partnership because you're not big enough. Um, so I, I just think that there, there needs to be more money in the pot to begin with, which is ring fence for specialist organizations <coughs> like ourselves, specialist buy and for organization. But the whole system needs to change from commissioning to grants and a simpler and a fairer process. That's all very fair, and then the ice turned too. Right. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, Tony. It was quite unnerving to have you on four screens around me all at the same time. Um, <laughs> so, so I think just to, to challenge one thing, so it gives the context of what I would say. So when it comes to any suggestion of underspending, and, and this can be checked with any transcript that I gave this morning when I was in front of the Budget and Performance Committee for a period of time, but any underspend that's associated with the growth figures for the programmes that interact, I think, most keenly with the subject of this discussion, the reason for it being perceived and looking like an underspend is because what we're all also working with here, and you're referring to it, I think, in the funding envelope, mm -hmm. is we are working with central government grants that work towards this sector. And a lot of the central government grants that work towards this sector and, and the sort of wider sectors that it interacts with come as in-year funding. So just on, on the budget and performance point, and I, I, did, I said this this morning, I promise I'm being consistent, but the reason why it appears in underspend is that the GLA is committed, I don't know which screen to look at, is committed to doing this. So we put forward a provisional budget and then we underspend that because it gets superseded by the utilization of the central government fund that has a, that has a time limit that we need to use in order to maximize the possibility of the commissioning. On the, the wider points, I think it is absolutely fair to say that this is a really complex area because whereas in, so if I think about the affordable housing programme where we've got to deliver these huge numbers, I talk to one central government department that has its own complexity because they interact with the central government's department, but I'm talking to one. When we're working here, we're working with multiple government departments. These organisations will likely be working with other funding sources from multiple government departments that have their own criteria, their own methodology, their own way of working, their own um, requirements in terms of process management and budget and expenditure. So the sourcing, of the source of the sourcing of that funding, I think, is reflective 
in the complexity of the, the enactment of the programmes, we have sought to simplify that in how people approach us. I absolutely recognise there can always be improvement in that. I'm very happy to have conversations about how we do that. That is an absolute requirement because I talked earlier about the importance of recognising the fragility of these organisations. So that that's fair. But I think one of the issues with the signposting, Tony, is that the signposting that I think is being discussed here is a signposting to multiple sources of funding of which we are not in any way the only one and of which there are multiple organizations that have a jurisdiction over it Na naturally um, i think that's sector that naturally, is can sector i just can work. i just jump in because i because I, I appreciate the chair wants to move on because there's lots of other things sure. but can i just set you the task if the committee agree that you will try and provide a almost no disrespect to anybody for my benefit anything an idiot's guide for those that don't spend their life uh looking for money in the public sector so it can be easily understood i appreciate the money comes from multiple pots and from multiple bits of government but if you can't simplify it so people with the need like these fi fine people on the panel can understand it clearly i do personally think we're more likely to underspend but I'll leave it there. But if, if perhaps when we do the actions for this meeting, you could have a go at uh, a good old fashioned process org chart, uh, I'm sure it will be helpful to everybody. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, we will move on. Thank you for that, Tony. Um, Assemblymember Berry. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we do tend to, uh, quite often in these meetings, we suddenly talk, actually, can we have a diagram? That is often what we, what we end up asking for. Um, I wanted to go back to the point about women and hidden homelessness. Um, we looked at this as a committee in 2017. I know that um, some Mungos have done some work on that since. It's one of, I mean, by definition, it's hard to measure. And I think possibly Zyber or Sarah might have some more idea of the, of the current situation of how significant an issue hidden homelessness is in in london at the moment i know some of you um hanana and and, and Kosa, you've both laid out potential reasons why women might not be known to the authorities and able to be sort of counted um but getting that number right and thinking about the the demand we have is, is kind of important so sorry sorry to challenge you there would you would you have any idea so I don't have the numbers or the, the most uh, current figures on that, uh, but some, some kind of general points uh, about uh, women in uh, hidden homelessness. So as uh, Kosa mentioned, rough sleeping is uh, overwhelmingly a male experience. Uh, I think the latest data that we had was that around 84% of rough sleepers w were men. But as you said, um, we also know that um, a lot of women who are rough sleeping tend to hide. And so there may be also some undercounting uh, going on when it comes to uh, women who are sleeping rough. Uh, so one of the reasons uh, is, I think, reflected on the, or is, is a consequence of the, the experiences of the women who are rough sleeping. So, and, and, and one of that, uh, one, of, one of those experiences is um, experience of abuse and violence. So we know that a, a very high proportion of women who are rough sleeping have a history of experience of um, abuse, domestic violence. Um, and so they will be um, trying to escape re-victimization, basically. Um, and this is why, as other members of the panel have already mentioned, it's so important to ensure that there are single sex um, spaces, shelters, where women who are sleeping rough can uh, access because- We'll have a specific question okay. on that in a moment. Um, I'm just trying to get an idea of the overall the overall picture there. I mean, compared with, compared with women who are in refuges in temporary accommodation receiving help as homeless women are there there are more of them who are hidden is that would that be a fair thing to say i couldn't answer that because i i'm not sure about the exact proportions um 
cyber you, you I, I was I, just about you, to say I don't think we know the answer basically mm. because they're hidden um, and and I think some sort of you know um, par partnership sort of survey ready for the for sector uh, members um, could help to fill that gap and to, to a bit of a census I suppose really in terms of tracking um, those women um, because they will I no no doubt come into contact with a variety of agencies um, I would say particularly more in the voluntary sector than the statutory sector probably um, I, I, if I may I think the um, and, and we're, so we're doing there's there's a momentary interaction so there's two moments when we might be able to in data terms measure where the women are who are in rough sleeping in the current system. Um, one of them is by street count. Mm -hmm. And then the other is by them presenting to them, themselves as homeless to their local authority. Mm -hmm. And the percentage that come up on a street count can't be right. Exactly. It can't be, because yeah. it's like less than 17%. And there's just, th there's no way that's true. It cannot be true. Um, but the, the, the sort of break in the system of how we find the real number is the way that street counts work, women hide from the people who are doing the street counting because they wouldn't go to those places of visible vulnerability or are less likely to, I should say, are less likely to. And then second to that, it might be the case that they have access to other informal routes whereby they do not then declare their homelessness. But there is immense vulnerability in those alternative routes. That is what I'm, I'm and, and this, and I think yeah. we're we're doing so. One of the projects that we're doing with our with our rough sleeping team is is trying to include in one of our services unverified women, so women who do not, who are not validated. I think it's unvalidated. I beg your pardon. They're not validated by the count at the local authority, and by doing that through the Life Off the Streets executive, get a sense of what the distortion is between the street count and the number of women being served in that in that pilot but a lot of service provision is reliant on them presenting themselves as homeless so so i think there's quite a few steps to go before we we know we know what that gap is really and the life off the streets executive that we're funding al along with london councils has is putting some programs and projects in place to try and address this because it is it comes back to the structural inequalities point I think we raised earlier really it's a big picture issue mm. so <clears throat> um, it's, very, it's very it's very hard we've tried to, to poll people to see if you're currently putting someone up who is otherwise who might otherwise be facing homelessness and and found numbers but it's you know then you know to, to get the numbers to break that down into women different ages was it, there isn't a big enough sample size available in the world basically yeah. sorry yes go on just yeah. add that um i mean even domestic abuse situations women a lot of women from minority cultures live in extended families they're and they stay there because they've got nowhere to go, but essentially they're homeless because they would rather go. Um, and also migrant women, um, you know, depend on, well, they'll be hidden homeless because either they don't go or because they stay with friends or relatives or go to temples and churches. They look for safe places. They try to look for safe places, but then they can get exploited by those, the same people. So often a lot of them meet strangers, even at church or a temple who offer to help them. They take them home, and, but then they treat them as a domestic servant. Um, so, the, so, so that could be another trap that they end up with. Or they live with the extended family and then they're under cultural pressure to go back or they're exploited or, and become domestic servants again. Um, so I think those kind of, those women need to be measured as well. But they're not likely going to come to the to the uh, to the notice of the authorities because they don't go to them to for help. Primarily, if you don't have a secure status, you know you're worried about your data being shared with the Home Office that you'd be subject to immigration enforcement action. And so, if you go to the police or housing or or anywhere social services, um, you could be deported because that information could go back to the Home Office. And that one of the things we have been asking for is some kind of firewall between you know someone reporting abuse or seeking help around abuse 
and that and their data personal data not being shared with the home office if they have insecure status because that's the only way you're going to be able to encourage them to come forward and that's also the only way you're going to be able to count them okay thank you um so moving over to to, to natalie again sorry um more broadly then can you outline how the mayor's homelessness work um, is acting to specifically support women who are facing homelessness in a more general sense yeah. um, so I, so I think the the programs to highlight would be um, that we've that we I think what everyone just described was a was a pathway was that there's various points in the pathway that are, that are failing and and I think the the pathway we're, we're p potentially outlining is one from destitution or rough sleeping through to permanent secure accommodation. Um, and, and I think what we are seeking to do um, within the constraints of the complicated funding that Tony referred to is about having, intervention, having an intervention tool in the different parts of that pathway. Oh, sorry, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, I, don't, I normally get accused of being too loud, so I'm trying not to <laughs> shout into the room. Um, and I think at the early part of that service, we are undertaking projects for um, rough sleepers, and that includes specific provisions, one of which I just outlined um, for women, and then also provisions and lobbying about migrant rough sleepers. And, and I think whilst in a lot of these cases I will always come back to the programmes matter there what impact women I think when it comes to migrant sleepers there is just a as you described so articulately a wealth of other things that need to change for us to get any of those people into a permanent secure place um, so we're doing interventions and working um, with specific pots of funding within the rough sleeping initiative settlement of which we've got funding for the next three years and there's specific provisions in the MD that went forward a few weeks ago um, and then when you go beyond that phase and we talk about um, the move on program that's a really important part of that and giving an option for people to go into um, more secure accommodation on that pathway and then I think the other relevant pieces are that are that we've put provisions in with the right to buy back program and others to to work on temporary accommodation and to your point absolutely it's often not a regular it's not a regulated sector so one of the ways that we think we can influence that is by assisting boroughs in their supply in their in their provision to have temporary accommodation that is decent so we're supporting that program um, and then we've spoken about general affordable housing provision and how we try and make that specific for women and then the other point that i'd highlight when we're talking about vulnerable women and those who might be on a homelessness duty is the things that we're doing under the domestic abuse act in part four um and it's a relatively recent duty so it's not at the forefront of my mind um but it means that we will be assisting in assessing the needs for accommodation based support for victims and survivors just of domestic to interrupt abuse. you natalie I feel yeah. like we're moving on to yeah. domestic yeah. abuse. Um, Assemblymember Baker is going to ask. Yeah, I was trying to ask about that. homelessness. Obviously, these are all but interconnected. I think, I think no, they're in my mind, they're yes. all part of that pathway because yeah. yeah. so, they're all interacting. But apologies if that was too sprawling. No, no, that's fine. Don't worry. Um, Assemblymember Bov. Just 11A. Um. This is a very simple question. Are there sufficient women only options uh, for the for? Um, it's just dropping 11A. It's just dropping 11A. I'm sorry. I do apologize. I misread that. Apologies for that confusion with question. This investigation is inclusive of uh, transgender women. And the following question is about the challenges that cisgender and transgender women may face if placed in accommodation with men. A number of responses to our call for evidence raise concerns about mixed gender accommodation for women experiencing homelessness or survivors of uh, domestic abuse. Is there a risk that women experiencing homelessness won't seek help 
because they are worried about being placed in mixed accommodation uh, with men or, uh, or that they will leave uh, support services that are mixed. And I note Ms. Buck uh, referred, to it, uh, referred to the provision of single-sex accommodation earlier, but I wonder if somebody else would like to come in on that issue. Ms. Ross. Uh, thank you. So there is research evidence uh, that shows that women indeed do self-exclude uh, from seeking uh, support or shelter when they are in a homeless uh, situation if um, there are not enough women only or single sex spaces. Um, so the shortage of single sex spaces when it comes to homelessness support will indeed or is indeed having an impact on women accessing those services and that is something that is um, that we have evidence for is that is that um, is that evidence something you can share with us at some point yes thank you marvelous thank you thank assembly you. Mem i think assembly member baker i skipped my you're skipping my question sorry i clearly wasn't paying attention to the order <laughs> Um, uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. <laughs> the confused half, half, the, uh, half the Assembly members. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, my, my questions are on domestic abuse and housing. Um, so they're the ma mainly to Kosara and Hanana. Um, and thanks so much for your contributions already. I think it's been really important to hear the issues in the round of the uh, um, subject rather than considering them as, as separate. So if there are things that you've already said, please do feel free to expand or um, or just refer back to your previous answers, whatever, whatever works. So my first question is, uh, how does accommodation for survivors of domestic abuse in London compare to elsewhere in the UK and what are the particular challenges that, uh, um, that, the, that are faced? Could I just start on about challenges? So women coming into refuges or safe accommodation have built a network of support and we all know they've been traumatised by the domestic abuse and taken them out of boroughs where they have no connections, for instance with health services or support networks can traumatise them further. So moving them out of borough can be very traumatising and it can kind of undo the recovery that they've done whilst they've been in refuge and safe accommodation. Um, so I think um, for migrant women, um, there's more provision in London, a uh, little that there is in London, but there's more provision in London and ar around no recourse to public funds than there are in other parts of the country. So there is even fewer resources for women to access. Um, now we, we dealt with about 400 cases of women through our no recourse to public funds under the MOPAC project for, for about two, two and a half years. Um, and that's compared to, we did a UK wide project, which is a home office pilot we're doing on no recourse to public funds, and that's 400 again for, for one year. Um, and you know, I, we just find that outside of London, mm -hmm. the, our partner organizations are really having problems in finding um, you know, accessible rent, you know, good quality accommodation, because a lot of the time they can't get women into refuges because they cannot pay the full rent or the refugees feel that they uh, can't keep them long enough um, uh, without rent. So I think London is slightly better, but the rents are higher um, as well. And so the prov so that's why we end up using bed and breakfasts and hotels because there isn't enough in our no recourse fund um, to be able to pay the higher rent uh, for long enough. Um, so I, I think that needs to be more dedicated provision also even in London around no recourse to public funds to improve that situation. And the other area I would say is around forced marriage and on a base violence is again there is very little provision around the specific needs of minority women who are suffering from harmful practices, um, and particularly young women. 
uh, who also find it difficult to mix with women from refugees generally because tend to be older. So they also tend to be more vulnerable. They're more likely to go home, back home, mainly because they're young and they're not used to living on their own and they have higher support needs. Mm -hmm. um, they don't ne they're not necessarily always migrant. They're, you know, often they're British born, but they're young and they're in a, in a, you know, very vulnerable and inexperienced. Uh, and, and it's very difficult to leave home and leave your parents behind and the whole family and the community because they're often stigmatized. They're often rejected and disowned for having brought shame and dishonor. And I think local authorities needs to be far more aware in the homelessness department about the specific issues and those specific needs, but also in terms of housing provision, accommodation for women, young women mm -hmm. from black and minority communities. Thank you, that's, that's really helpful. Um, Kosa, can I just follow up on, on your contribution, just to yeah. check I've got it right, you were talking about movement out of boroughs, that once once women come out of refuge, they're then moved elsewhere, because, yes. yes. And I is that something that we see more in London, or is that, obviously not boroughs, but area to area, do, are, are you aware if that's more common in London, or is that a general problem? There's still gatekeeping going on, where women are actually uprooted and sent out of London. So that's still going on, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, so. Okay. And what I wanted to say was most of the women that go into temporary accommodation, yeah. they are given nothing. They have no flooring, they have no yeah. beds, they have nothing. So we have to, Solis have provided grants for women yeah. to have beds and essentials. So 200 women were supported and families with grants that we funded. So there isn't enough for those women who are going into these properties and have barely nothing. They're destitute and have nothing. And so that's, um, it, so it's to do with the cost of, um, housing in London, so it's it's more likely that a woman who's been in a refuge in London is going to end up outside. Is that yes? Yeah, right. Thank and you. even in London, it's just like yeah. that. There's nothing. Yeah. They don't take into account that they're going into these properties with yeah. nothing and expect to sleep on the floor with their children. Yeah, yeah. that must be pretty traumatic. Um, thank you. Um, next question is, um, and we have covered this a bit, but um, just. So to make sure that you've got everything across that, that you'd like to, uh, do black and global majority women face additional barriers to get the housing support they need when they experience domestic abuse? Um, so in terms of the housing support, I've, I've mentioned what migrant women and y young women. One area I think that needs more attention as well is women where they're housed, the areas uh, they're housed in, isolated estates or usually the single parents and because they're from a minority culture they also experience racism and racial harassment and they have language problems and they're usually on their own because they're rejected by their communities um, and I think there needs to be better provision in terms of temporary and more permanent housing where women are given are not put into so isolated areas and they have more choice about where they can live. Um, you know, some of them, yeah, m move out of London and they're not assisted to come back into London even though the local authority has placed them there. Or there's arguments about who's, which local authority has responsibility for them even though, you know, a London local authority might have put them there. So I, I just think there are complications like that which which are our additional barriers. I think racism and their vulnerability due to their ethnicity I is another one. Thank you. Because do you have anything to add? Yeah, can I just add about older women? It's so difficult for older women who probably have equity in their homes. They've owned their homes for a long time. They're reluctant to leave their homes and come to a refuge because of fear of losing their home. And safe accommodation can be very difficult for them when they need a professional to support them. They can't come to a refuge and have a carer. So we need to think about the older women who need more support. And sheltered accommodation, there's such long waiting lists for sheltered accommodation. So what options are there for older women? Thank you. Um, Kasa, this is uh, to you initially. Uh, um, Hanani may have uh, views as well. In response to the call for evidence, Solace Women's Aid raid c raised concerns about how local authorities apply their powers to allocate housing. Could you expand on this? I know you've talked about the, the gatekeeping. Um, I would also be interested in your views on, on why that is, and not just uh, um, what, the, what the specific problem is. The gatekeeping is going on, in my opinion, as because the staff, the housing officers, need more training. 
they're not very clued up about domestic abuse and we need to actually work on this specialism. We need to provide co-locate co adverts perhaps in boroughs where they can share their expertise and knowledge with housing officers. House, housing officers require evidence and the application process is such a long drawn process and very traumatizing for the survivors. Everything has to be sent in advance and yet I'm seeing them having to do interviews, long interviews over the phone, interrogating, not being believed, not believing their history of abuse, questioning them about their support needs, if they have any additional support needs. So I do think this is an area that we need to kind of focus on mm. to train housing officers and local departments, housing authorities. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? The, yeah, the housing departments, I think they tend to kind of, uh, some of them ask for evidence even when you're homeless of domestic abuse. You may not even have gone to the police at that stage and you may not have any evidence and because you, you're homeless at that um, and you need that immediate accommodation. Um, and I think that deters women or prevents women from getting access and they shouldn't really be uh, asking them for that type of evidence straight away. Um, and then I think, you know, of course, there's the local connection problem, you know, that you, you one local authority says, well, you can go to any local authority, why are you coming here? But actually, victims of domestic abuse can go wherever they feel safe. So it's, it, it is part of training, but also it is about, uh, about policy. You know, what is your policy as a local authority around domestic abuse and what do you include in it and what do you expect, what evidence do you need? Um, how do you deal with local collection? What do you define as priority need? Uh, because sometimes victims of forced marriage um, are not seen as in priority need uh, because they're not seen as victims of domestic abuse. So, so I think it is about policy as well as training and, and, and standards that just need to be improved. I mean, the unnecessary arguments if people just followed, mm. you know, the homelessness code and, you know, but they don't. So, so it's not just about the interpretation of those policies. Different Sorry? Sorry, it's not just about the interpretation of those policies by individual officers. It's actually that it's a different authorities will have slightly different policies. Apologies. Yeah, I think I'm, there's I'm variations. So I'm not aware. So yes, there's definitely variations okay. between local authorities, um, and I think those policies need to be kind of standardised to to a standard that is that meets you know within the homelessness code. Thanks very much. And my last question is, uh, the mayor has new duties under the Domestic Abuse Act 2021, which came with, came with government funding. Do the changes go far enough to address the needs of survivors of domestic abuse in London? Just, can I say, I think obviously we'll welcome that duty around accommodation, but of, within that you've got to cover the needs of all women. So migrant women, for example, need more uh, safe accommodation. And I think that that needs to be built in. It's supposed to be built in, but obviously t I think you need more provision. Um, um, also, I think you need to kind of locate it in a holistic provision of services. The MOPAC at the moment is funding us to, uh, to, to not only give cost, you know, rental costs for women with no recourse to public funds, but also to provide advocacy, to provide counselling, to provide educational classes, so that women become independent, so you have better outcomes for women who are trying to escape abuse, um, and so they don't return to abusive relationships. Uh, and I think the holistic provision is also quite important. It, it, you need that wraparound support with any kind of accommodation support you provide. Um, and I, I don't think that there is enough being, doing, being done about that. Thank you. Can I just add, there's not enough um, specialist provision for victims and survivors who are black and minoritized and are yeah. deaf and disabled, including those with a physical disability, a learning disability, and mental health support needs, and are young and affected by multiple disadvantage or have substance support needs. And also MOPAC has recognised that there is not sufficient provision for larger families, especially those that have older boys who are excluded from refuges and safe accommodation due to not having bed mm. space provision. And also for LGBTQ+, and the male survivors of victims, the survivors of domestic abuse. Uh, thank, thanks very much. That's the end of my questions. And can I just say thank you to you both and, and your organisations for the work you do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank
Thank you, Assemblymember Baker. Did you want to add something before yeah, we move to the next sorry. panel? <laughs> I was doing no, that's okay. Wide angle Fine. gulping. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> it's, these are the most important women in the room today, I think. Um, I, I think it doesn't do everything. It's a welcome progression in the right direction. It doesn't do everything. The mayor's consistently noted that there would be there would be benefits to having more of the wraparound support. I think with the with the twenty point six nine million that we've allocated to by and for organisations to use your use your terms, yeah. that has included allocation. I think SWA have been given five hundred and eighty six K to provide additional support, but we absolutely recognise that it needs to do more and we really want to work with the sector to try and lobby to have that change because I think the more wraparound support it does, the more it might also assist with those issues of people having security in borough because the purpose of it being a pan-London duty is that it 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 takes away, it reduces a local authority's self-interest in this process. Um, and so, I, so I, I think it absolutely is imperfect but I also do want to recognise that those multiple organisations who've got that £20 million pounds are in a much better place than they were before this duty. And I think all of everyone at this quorum working together to improve, to improve that provision will be welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Um, we've touched on this a bit throughout, really. Um, it's just impossible to talk about the housing needs of women without talking about specialist housing provision really and how important that is and for full disclosure i used to work in um, the field of social housing and spent a whole period of time setting up women only and lesbian only accommodation as well as um, housing schemes for um, gay men living with hiv and aids so i've got quite a lot of experience of setting these up so that kind of probably predisposes me towards um, thinking that there are benefits to it, um, but my question is, what are the benefits of housing that is targeted to the needs of specific groups of uh, women, such as that offered by Housing for Women, or co-housing schemes for older women, and any other sp specialist accommodation that you are aware of? So I think I'm going to start with Zyber, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have, um, in terms of our general needs accommodation, we give tenancies to the women. I mean, I, I know it sounds obvious, I think what it says, what it says on the tin, but I think um, in in other uh, other associations could benefit from doing that. Really, I think um, where where there's a uh, where there's a um, heterosexual couple, for example, um, perhaps not giving the tenancy uh, as a joint tenancy, perhaps just giving the tenancy to the woman, that give, that empowers the woman. Should there be a breakdown in that relationship, and there's a d there's different there are different power power balance then um, essentially, which I think would help um, in a number of areas. I said. Um, so the other services that we uh, the specialist services that we uh, provide have been um, designed um, really to meet gaps of provision essentially that um, that aren't met through um, local authority sort of commissioning um, and sort of traditional routes. So we've been working with um, trafficked women, um, who uh, uh, tra women who've been trafficked into the UK, um, and I would say we've had um, different iterations of that project. So we've had accommodation and support services together um, for fairly long uh, periods of time. So a long stay, you know, I would I would consider it to be long stay given supported housing. So sort of one or two years stay, um, waiting for women to get their um, uh, leave to remain essentially so that they can then move on to permanent accommodation um, that's provided through through whatever means um, and that and that that project itself has um, um, evolved I would say over the last 10 years um, essentially so now we've got a combination of like a drop-in service um, that's providing a wider support to women who've been trafficked because we can't because I suppose really fundamentally we can't afford to fund um, the total envelope, which is both housing and support um, through trusts and, and foundations, which is where we've gotten our money from so far. Um, so we've had to limit our accommodation. Um, so we've, we've reduced, I mean, these are tiny numbers to start off with. So I think originally we were housing 10 women at a time. We're now housing four women at a time, but we're supplementing that with a drop-in service that is providing really 
specific trauma-informed um, support to those women. Um, I think um, sort of flexible support because a, a lot of these women can't really don't really have um, I, what I would say traditional routines necessarily. You know, they're travelling from across London. They may be in NAS accommodation. Um, uh, you know, our accommodations have been hack uh, our services have been hackney. So you know, they're, they're travelling across London. Um, it has to be flexible. It's it's person centred. Um, it's practical, and uh, you know, so we're we're giving women vouchers and things for for um, food uh, and transport, but also maybe a change of clothes. So it's it's really sort of um, you know basic you know basics for life really, um, as well as that emotional support um, and practical support to help them through. Uh, they they'll have uh, legal representation essentially that's helping them through the asylum process essentially um, but it's it's about um, helping them to develop their independence essentially to live as independently as possible given their circumstances really. do you think the fact that it is the specialist support in that way um, means that you end up with better outcomes i would say so yes i mean i haven't got any data with me today but um uh uh, I mean, our other projects for women coming out of prison have had really um, good outcomes around reoffending. So we've had a project running for women who have um, been estranged from their children through through their prison sentence, um, and the reoffending rates there have been less than five percent compared with the national average of over fifty percent in terms of reoffending. So that's a, that's one one bit of data really. Um, but I, think I mean, certainly, I'm, it's, it's going after all that funding is you know, to provide that additional specialist support was the bit that I always found was, you know, where you were talking to the Home Office or the Probation Service to leverage in extra money for women leaving prison, and that always was such a, you know, an overlooked group or young women who were fleeing the home because of incest or. Mm or they were at fear that they might be taken abroad to be married and didn't, you know, that wasn't something that they, they wanted. Um, so all sorts of sets of circumstances that, um, but the additional funding from children's services or the home office or the probation service always made it easier to provide the tailored support. Is that what you're, is, you yes. must, I mean, you must we, be doing? Again, as I said earlier, we give we get a sort of patchwork, we have a patchwork of, of, of funding essentially not very much from sort of statutory organisations uh, or statutory grant givers, I have to say, but I'm hoping that that might change going forward. Um, but um, uh, you know, it is an in it, these these services. There, I would say they're. Uh, you know, I don't really want. Uh, I'm going to be quite reasonably careful about what I say, but they they're expensive. It costs money are, yeah. to to deliver intensive support to any yeah. client group. But I would say, you know, women who have been traumatised because they've been trafficked, because they've suffered domestic abuse, um, because they've come, come out of prison and they, you know, they're, they're left with, you know, a couple of quid in their pocket, essentially. You know, the, these are these are services that, co you know, on a um, cost per hour basis are very expensive. But on a sort of value for money basis, from a social and economic, socio-economic socio basis, they are, I would say, exactly the right thing to do. They stop, I would say, they have a significant impact in stopping sort of revolving door sort of syndrome in terms of... So that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, that it absolutely. might be very expensive for those two years when the intensive support goes in, but yeah. after the two years, um, you know, you might find that someone has now rebuilt their life and the support is no longer required and they're now able to go off and do whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's cost 60,000, something in the region of 60,000 pounds to keep a woman in prison for a year, you know, that's that that could do a lot of good basically in any one of our <laughs> organizations yeah so four years of <laughs> you know successful you spend sixty thousand for those two years and then that person doesn't go back to prison for yes, four absolutely. years afterwards and you've just saved absolutely. um you know a huge amount Never of money mind about these sort of associated costs around you know um ch ch their children going into social care y yes the additionality the, of the impact money. on the the next generation and yeah. all the rest of it i don't know whether you want to add anything to that as well sarah otherwise i'm going to bring in Natalie did you want to comment on that and specialist services and the value for money element or any other aspect I think that um, kind of added value uh, that these services provide the the 
social added value that they provide. And just as w what uh, you were mentioning about the uh, preventative side of these services and the savings that they um, provide to uh, departments like health or justice or um, or mental health, actually. Mm. We mental haven't health. mentioned mental health yes, services. Exactly. Certainly the schemes I was setting up for young lesbians, you know, there was uh, quite a lot of um, support from people living in the same um, dwelling that really lessened the impact sometimes on mental health services quite dramatically. Yeah, so I, th I think these services should really be seen as an investment uh, yeah. because they will, you know, they will save money in the longer term. They will um, save harm as well and and um, uh, save a lot of women from more misery or more violence or more mm. revictimization mm. revictimization um, so they th I think they should be seen as as uh, definitely an investment um, and just some uh, a, a kind of a broad point that I wanted to make in terms of the importance of specialist services uh, women only services is that we know that um, homeless women, women who experience homelessness, they are more likely than the general kind of women population to have experienced trauma, to have experienced mm. male violence. And so this is, again, an indication of how important these specialist services, these women-only spaces are uh, for these women to um, you know, to rebuild their lives and to have the support that they need. I mean, uh, Natalie, you've heard what Zyber and Sarah are saying there about the importance of those services. I'm going to come to Kassar and Hanana in a second, um, but I just wanted to just get your viewpoint on what the mayor is doing to encouraging the development of these vital schemes that can be so transformative for people. Yeah. For women. Um, We've got a variety of programmes that are in place. Um, Homelessness Change, the Move On programme, there's provision to support it through the AHP. And we deeply, we want, and, and the community led housing programme, for example, is working with a black led women's, um, black single parents who've spent time in TA who are looking to do community led housing, which I know is one of your other passions. Um, and we've worked with the London Older Lesbians Co housing initiative. But, but I think what our team needs to continue to work on and lobby with with the central government is, is about these wraparound services for specialists and supported housing. So as, as the key example to that, when we moved into the negotiation for the AHP for the 21 to 26, where the intent behind that was that specialists and supported housing was supported through that mechanism, that it's really welcome in that it sets an ambitious target and it holds us, it holds all parties to account on it, which is really positive. However, it doesn't have any revenue funding associated with it. So in the initial in the initial bidding round, we had a really minimal number of bids. And it's not because these organisations <laughs> don't need support and it's not because they don't have clients who need it. It's because everything they're saying recognises that in a commissioning process, there needs to be a correlation between the support needs of the individual and the funding and the funding that's associated with how they're supported. Um, and I and I will. I, this might be against Assembly rules, so Zoe might kill me. Um, and I'm not speaking on behalf of this organisation, but as an as it's an area that I also care about, I sit on the board of an organisation that interacts with this quite strongly. Um, and I know that even within that organisation for a number of years, and partly as a result of the, the strains that are on local authorities in terms of commissioning, even when there is revenue funding made available through, through central government processes, it's not because of the wider austerity environment. It doesn't, it doesn't make that match. So quite often I think organisations like the like the laudable ones our colleagues are running here, will be in a position where they're making really difficult choices about their ability to function as an organisation financially because they desperately want to support the most vulnerable women, but the revenue support and wraparound services don't match in quantum the, the women that they're targeting. A and I think one of, our, one of our working measures when we're looking at how we utilise the duties we have is to continue 
to to push local to push central government to say that we need those services to be considered holistically i mean we we had a separate session i think actually when assembly member berry was the chair and we had representatives from the g15 came in and was saying quite openly to us well we probably might not be staying in this field of additional supported um alongside you know producing you know a fall off the shelf type housing um, because it's too expensive and there's not enough revenue support for this kind of work so um, we probably won't be bothering to do this kind of stuff in the future which was you know is actually quite horrific but i mean i'm just going to come on to um kasar and hanana if there's anything that you want to say it, uh, on the question i just asked about the, the the need for the specialist housing and and how that helps um, but I also wanted to bring in the issue of um, which we've touched on a little bit about moving on and, and whether or not there's, um, you know, there's enough help for that, um, but specialist housing. So as we know, there's very limited accommodation for women with multiple disadvantage. Uh, women with higher support needs will, will be excluded from refuge accommodation. Solace have a multi-disadvantage refuge which enables women to get holistic support to address their substance misuse issues that they have and mental health issues. And it prevents a cycle of becoming homelessness again. So it's proving very useful. We need to have more kind of refuges such mm. as this. As we know, there are only a handful of services in, and they're in, bur in boroughs. And if you're out of borough, you can't access the services. So this has a disadvantage for those people who are homeless. I would also say that we back the Pan London housing reciprocal that the government initiative is doing because it will help women to sustain their tenancies where they've got equity and social tenancy. And it, it will help them to maintain their tenancy rights. And also the sanctuary scheme, we've got it in some of our Pan London boroughs, so we should have it across all our boroughs because it helps women to feel safe in their own accommodation. You mean the borough sanctuary scheme yes. that some boroughs are now starting to, uh, I think Lewisham might have been the first, yes. and I think Wandsworth has started to talk about it. I'm not sure it's actually changed anything yet, but it is talking about embracing that. You'd like to see that pan London? It would really be beneficial okay. for our survivors who can sustain those tendencies, social tendencies. Hanana, thank you. Um, I mean, migrant women don't usually have, can stay in, in their homes so they, it's, it's, I don't think it's going to benefit them because they don't have the tenancy. But, but in terms of the specialist provision and um, set of specialist accommodation, critical to very positive uh, outcomes. I think research after research has shown that, that black and minority women, where they access specialist services within their own communities, which are provided by, by and for organizations, um, does lead to much better outcomes and reduce re-victimization. Re I mean, even our own research, and we're not a housing agency, but we do help women to access housing. Um, you know, we've got 80 to 9 percent of success rates in feeling safer, feeling more confident. We've got a 100 percent success rate in preventing deportation. That, and we've been around over 40 years. This is 100 um, percent. And we've, you know, we fight for every single woman. And nobody else does that. To be honest, we work beyond our, uh, you know, working hours. We get paid very little, and we are high good, va you know, we're good value to local authorities because we get, we do a lot for very little. And I think that situation needs to be improved, obviously, because it cannot be, it's not sustainable. Um, and also, it's, it doesn't help all women because you've not enough services. Um, and I think the Domestic Abuse Commissioner at the moment is doing some research on the cost benefits of, you know, providing, well, providing benefits for women, migrant women. But one of the part of that research is looking at the, the benefits that's provided by, by and for services, how they add value, um, and how they, you know, are disproportionately dealing with cases, but also at disproportionately lower, lower you know, ben, uh, funding. Uh, and they're 5% less likely to get government funding compared to the rest of, uh, according to the DA Commissioner's reports. But they're good values. So I think, you know, they, they shouldn't be taken advantage of, and they have been, but they have huge uh, cost benefit because women do it because they're dedicated to, to, to do this. You know, we as workers have been around 35 or 36 years like I have, but. You know, you have to really stick to it, and you get very little money for it. But the biggest reward, obviously, is saving lives and 
uh, creating change. And, uh, and I think that it, it is time now that, you know, that where there's greater awareness of these type of issues, that there is, and, and, and a stated will to do something, that there is money that goes with it. Um, and those services have to be fully supported, both financially and politically, because they are on the front line within their own communities, usually have hostility from the communities, from men within their communities, from conservative religious and community leaders who do not want specialist women's organizations existing within their own their communities, encouraging women to leave home and empowering them and so forth. Uh, and also, you know, racism and hostility that we get outside of those communities. And, you know, obviously more and more agencies like MOPAC, GLA, the government also, they wanted to address these issues, but that has to go with some dedicated funding, ring fence funding, and far more, you know, far more funding. And there is a cost, then, you know, there's a social value to it, mm -hmm. which I think there needs to be more research on. We're doing a bit of research ourselves, uh, but I think there needs to be more, maybe something that GLA can do as well. Yeah, the benefits that you get, if, you know, if the investment is made, if you can yeah. call it that, at the right time, I think that's the important point, uh, is almost incal incalculable because it is just so much that can be saved and, and the benefit to each individual in terms of a better life outcome yeah. is just uh, And immense. children, it's not just yeah. women and children, it's and whole families. Children. No, absolutely, yeah. Having also set up some mother and baby homes, yeah. um, as they were rather uh, called, you know, for very young women who otherwise probably would, you know, would not have sustained the relationship with the, the child because, yes. you know, they were suffering from, you know, difficulties in yeah. bonding or whatever it was. But, yeah, I think that it's it's the investment at the right time, mm. isn't it? That's, that's the really important thing. And can I um, join with my colleague in saying, you know, thank you to all those of you who are delivering services. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I do apologise that we are slightly over, but I do want to ask you all one final question. Oh, before I do my final <laughs> question, Assembly Member Bond. I do apologise. It was just something that occurred to me um, earlier about uh, uh, cooperative arrangements. Um, what opportunities does co-housing provide uh, to meet the needs of women, especially older, uh, older women? Uh, and those with families, uh, co-housing is something that's been trialled in London now and the success is good. I just wondered if anybody had anything to contribute to that. Um, so just to respond on that, um, we, we, have pa we partnered with the um, Older Women's Co-Housing Group um, to deliver the, the first co-housing group in the UK, uh, the Older, uh, the older Sorry, the first older co-housing uh, in the UK, um, uh, which was probably handed over about uh, s five or six years ago now. Um, so that's a mixed tenure scheme, um, uh, predominantly home uh, leaseholders, and uh, a very small um, number of um, social housing uh, units within that, really. Um, and that's been an incredibly successful scheme. It's take, it took something around 15 years to get off the ground. Um, uh, fell, fell through many hurdles um, along, its, along its journey. I think it certainly offers a, a model uh, for older, older women um, and those with families. Um, but I think, there, I think um, more work needs to be done around um, I think it works with that tenure mix, I suppose, is what I'm saying, really. Yeah. So homeowners and probably less social housing, because I think it's really difficult to... Co-housing is based on a premise that um, individuals come together as a community before they even begin to build, really, essentially. So you have to have a sort of stake in that of some description. Um, and I think it's quite difficult to do that as a, soci as a social housing tenant. So I think you have to have some sort of capital... Um, uh, to, to put into the pot essentially um, to uh, for that to materialize but I do think it's I think the the um, philosophy around co-housing um, I'd be very interested in sort of understanding a bit you know uh, working with our, our our partners essentially understanding a bit more about how that could be applied to other tenure types essentially 
Thank you. Uh, that's fascinating, actually, and, and gave me much more than I thought I wanted. But <laughs> would you mind if we wrote to you at some other no, point not to, at all. to get not some at all. of those pointers uh, that you've uh, established? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Hanana had a. Oh, you might. Oh, sorry. That's. Oh, that's fine. Um, thank you very much for, for that. So the final question is, um, the final point really is to thank you all for today and for your depth and breadth of knowledge that you shared with us here. And hopefully um, that we will help us make some informative next suggestions for next steps. And um, if, if you don't have any thoughts at the moment and you want to perhaps write back to us, you're, you're really welcome to do so. But the final question is to ask you all whether there's anything else that you'd recommend on how housing for women can be improved in London. And it can be that you'll go and think about it and then let us know to then add to our documents. I think one of the points I wanted to raise was, um, and I know um, they're not on the panel today, but really getting, um, listening to the voices of women with lived experience, really. Um, we can sit here as, as so-called experts, is what I would like to say, really. And we've all lit, worked in our sectors for a long time. But I think the, 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 the expertise that women who have been through a lot of these circumstances bring to to the table and the and the um, it, it's just such a vivid um, uh, a vivid experience I suppose really and really powerful um, and I think you know women themselves know what they need they don't need us as experts to sort of tell them I suppose um, so we need we need to we need to have more space to listen to um, women who have have had those experiences. Thank you. Would anybody else in the panel like to comment or? We're all good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sorry. Just oh, sorry. Just just <laughs> a general point is I think most women would like is more affordable social housing. Really, I think most people would like that. But you know, for for women ourselves, you know, we work with you know just access their own good quality accommodation for themselves and the children is for them is what what they want yeah. I, I think the only thing that I, I would just sort of slightly riff off that point to say that I it's very logical as to why it's my directorate that's in this discussion um, and I think there's something incredibly valued about putting that lived experience with a respect to emotional labour as well and, and the fatigue and the capacity that women have because, you know, as you say, in a trauma-informed way, they've often experienced enough. But integrating that into governance structures is is of assistance. And I know some of the specialist organisations have made exemplary strides in doing that. Um, but as a as a signposting thing about the wider the wider angle lens of this as well, I do think when as a placemaking organisation, um, we look at what inclusive design means. I think those voices need to come into that conversation as well, because I'm aware that, you know, where we, where I as, I as an officer have the majority of funding deploy to deploy is about housing supply, um, and we need to get the design and implementation of that right so it doesn't exacerbate any of these multifaceted risks that women are already facing. So I think that's just a wide angle lens point that I always think is, is welcome in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you all. So thank you to our guests for all of your contributions today. Um, can we note the report and today's discussion? Thank you. Uh, can we also delegate authority to me as chair in consultation with party group lead group lead members to agree any output from the discussion. Agreed. Great. Um, and on the work programme, can we note our work, work programme and the informal activity undertaken since our last meeting, namely the visit to Akaya Housing Association? Great. And the date of the next meeting of the committee is scheduled for the 21st of September 2022 at 10 a.m. in the chamber. And I have no urgent business and I therefore declare this meeting to be closed.